Hi, welcome to this latest episode of Lightboard Lessons, and today we're going to talk about uh, the basic big IP nomenclature. And we've started releasing, back in January, we started releasing some articles on, um, you know, Dev Central basics, and, and we're really just kind of talking about the very basic things about F5 technology, uh, like what is a load balancer and what is a proxy. And, and so I will point you to those articles, and as part of that, we're going to talk about the basic big IP nomenclature, kind of from, you know, starting at the hardware and climbing the stack up to what makes traffic flow through the box. And so we're going to start with what is big IP. And big IP is the platform. And it doesn't matter if it's a hardware platform like our Viprion, uh, which is our modular platform where you can slide um, uh, modules in and out uh, based upon your needs, whether you need a 100 gig module or, or something less than that. Uh, so you have your, uh, your Viprion uh, that is a chassis with blades. And then uh, you also have your appliances. And these are the ones that, you know, they come and that's the way they are. And if you need more compute power, then you just buy more appliances. And then we also have our virtual editions which you can get licenses for several different uh, speeds and, and, uh, and that, so that's just a, a license key and you install uh, the ISO in your own environment or you can uh, spin up instances in Amazon or Azure or, or you know, other uh, uh, VMware enabled uh, environments as well. So a lot of different hypervisors that the virtual editions can run on. And so when we talk about Big IP, we have the hardware and the virtual hardware, but then we also have the software, and this is where our, our modules come in. So like our local traffic manager, which is, is kind of the, the, uh, the core functionality of Big IP. And this is where um, some of the other technology we'll talk about in a second, your, your pools and your nodes and your uh, SSL offloading, you know, that kind of exists there. And then you have your access policy manager and your um, application uh, security manager, you know, your advanced firewall manager, and, and a lot of these are uh, security related. Then you have your F5 DNS, uh, which is the global load balancing, but also all DNS services. And uh, you know we could go on and on with all the different modules that are available for Big IP, but Big IP is the platform, and then hardware, software modules that, um, that are part of that platform. And so after we start at the Big IP, then we actually are looking at, you know, within this hardware or this virtual hardware, um, you know, we start at the, let's actually just draw one of these guys. And we'll start at the network interface. So, you know, we have either a physical NIC or a virtual NIC. And this is how we're connecting to other networking devices in order to pass traffic. And so that's a physical NIC in a box or a VNIC uh, in a virtual, um, in, in one of the virtual editions. And then what you can do with these NICs is you can actually aggregate them. And, and so this is link aggregation, which is kind of the standard industry term. In fact, you can learn the link aggregation control protocol LACP in order to control how those set up. Um, but, you know, like in the Cisco world, you would call this ether channel. Um, but uh, link aggregation, uh, and then and when you're actually configuring this, say this is going to a switch. Um, when you're actually configuring this in the big IP, you're going to configure a trunk. And that trunk will be any number of, um, of these network interfaces that are bundled together. Uh, so if you're on an appliance that only has one gig NICs and you need four gigs, then you would bundle four or eight, um, depending on you know how much overhead or uh, the, or I mean uh, how how much extra bandwidth you want to be able to plan for uh, spikes and uh, and stuff. But you know you're going to trunk these together, so you would actually define a trunk on the big IP and you would bundle these network interfaces together. And so the next stepping stone above the trunk is to come to the VLAN. And within the VLAN, this is obviously 
a layer two construct. And this is where we're actually going to have uh, ethernet frames going on the wire. So across one of these trunks, you would have um, your VLAN, or it doesn't have to be a trunk. Say we have another network interface down here. Um, and we can say this is an appliance with six. Um, I haven't touched the hardware in a long time, so there, there might be one with six, I don't know. But um, let's say there's six on this uh, particular appliance. And um, we want to have one VLAN that is dedicated to a particular NIC. And so we could say, I'm gonna assign that interface, which we'll say on this appliance is 1.6. And so with that particular VLAN, I would have an untagged, Um, an untagged VLAN because I'm dedicating that NIC. I don't need to pass tags for on that Ethernet frame. But if I want to use, say, a trunk, um, say I want to use this trunk and I want to use VLANs 2, 3, and 4 on that, I need to be able to segregate that traffic and so we add a, a VLAN tag. So on this trunk that we've defined, then I will have tagged VLANs two, three, and four. But I don't have to do that on a trunk. I could also just use this interface, which uh, we'll say is 1.3, and say we'll tag VLANs four and five on that tag. Um, and so that's how you work with the different VLANs. And, and then, so there's another concept on the Big IP uh, for VLANs, and that's the concept of a VLAN group. And so if I have a big IP, and say you have an environment where you, you have, um, imagine for a second that that big IP is not there. And so you've got your router and the gateway is dot one, and we'll say this network is 172.16.4, okay? And this router gateway is uh, point one, and your server assets are back here and say this is dot two, dot three, and dot four. So with this not here, pretend for a second this is just a dumb switch, then everything's going to be able to communicate just fine. But if I put a big IP in here and say this is my external VLAN now and this is my internal VLAN, now I'm layer two segmented but I still have a single layer three network. And so what I can do is I can define a VLAN group and I make the external VLAN and the internal VLAN part of that group. And so now I can bridge traffic across the big IP uh, so that anything that was there before layer three can still do what it needs to do, but then we can uh, take care of our um, take care of our, our, our load balancing or application delivery services on the big IP without interrupting or requiring a re-architecture of this network. So that's what uh, VLAN groups are, uh, are useful for. And so climbing to the next layer, to layer three, we have the self-IP. And of course, any routing. And so, the self-IP is useful for getting traffic to the box or traffic from the box, but not through the box. You don't, you don't talk to self-IPs for, uh, for um, traffic that's traversing the big IP. And so if you want to communicate, say uh, you're setting up a, a local traffic and global traffic scenario and you need uh, the, uh, the iQuery protocol for the FIDNS to be able to talk to the big IP, you know, it's going to come to a self-IP to do that, and that's going to talk on uh, TCP 4343. And so on the self-IPs, you can, you know, accept no traffic, and you can accept default, which has things like SSL port, uh, um, SSH, iQuery, uh, the ability to ping that interface, or you can have a very custom locked down experience on what you're going to allow to your self-IPs. So if you know on, say, if you have like, you know, six interfaces connected to three public networks and then uh, maybe four different DMZs internally, but only one interface has to listen for iQuery traffic, well, then you don't necessarily want to allow that port on those other networks. You can lock that down. 
And so that's what the self IP is useful for. Also, if you're sending traffic, uh, you know, like your pool traffic, your pool monitor traffic, um, any of the other management services that might be running on your uh, host OS on your big IP, then you know it's going to go out from that self IP or the management port if you're doing um, all of your services on the management side. Uh, but you know self IPs used. Uh, in those those instances uh, for um, especially monitor traffic. Um, and then routing, you can do static routing or dynamic routing. The dynamic routing is an actual a license that, that you can buy to do, uh, you know, like OSPF or BGP or anything like that. But static routing, you add the routes. Um, and incidentally, we'll talk about it a little bit more when we get to virtual servers, but a static route on the box does not mean that the traffic is going to pass through your box. It means it knows how to get there, but it doesn't mean that it's going to honor that route. You need more uh, configuration um, for, for traffic that's coming through the box. Uh, static routes as far as uh, management traffic, leaving, leaving big IP locally, um, you know, those static routes are, are useful for that. But anything traversing the box um, needs more than just a route. And then the next construct we have is a node and a node you would consider like a host like a server you know and that server is or that host is an IP address so the the big IP will store nodes and that that's just an IP address it could be IPv4 IPv6 but it's it's just an IP and then the next construct would be pools and so in the pool you have um, server um, services, right? Anything, anything on a, boy, that's really terrible writing. Um, so it'd be a server service. And so services are running on ports. And so a pool, anything you add to the pool is gonna be an IP port combination. And so that can be IPv4, IPv6, it can be port 80 and port 8080 or pay, port 59,672. Uh, the pool doesn't care how many different combinations of IPs and ports you add. It's just saying that this is a collection of services. And as long as your application is running on all of those services, when we pass traffic or when the big IP passes traffic to it, it'll be able to respond. But that pool is just a collection of services and, and or you know a collection of IP ports in the configuration. And you can do a lot of different things with pools. You can set priorities as far as how many um, different servers you want active in that pool at a particular time. You can set ratios. So if you have a server from 2006 versus a server from 2017, uh, probably the 2017 server can do a lot more from a compute perspective. And so you could set that server to get a lot more of the traffic than the one from 2006. Um, but you know, a lot of different options uh, that that you can set on, <clears throat> excuse me, on pools. And then. We also have SNAT, and that's like a secure NAT address translation. You can't actually address a SNAT. Um, well, there's one unique case that you can, but mostly uh, SNATs can't be addressed. You can't send traffic to them, but they're useful in uh, translating your source traffic into another address on the way back to a uh, server so that you can uh, bring traffic back to the big IP. And so if you have Public, um, uh, public address is coming in and you don't want to uh, send the public address at the IP layer back to the server, uh, you would use a SNAT for that and then, and then you can pass that in the, the, like a, um, uh, a header to uh, send that, that source IP back. But also a SNAT's useful for if you, and of course there's uh, direct SNATs and then there's SNAT pools and with a snap pool. So if you have a virtual server uh, on the front side that is going to handle more than 64K connections, then you might exhaust ports on a single IP on the backside sending it out to your array of servers. And so if you have a pool, you can fill that pool with many addresses and then, and then that way uh, you won't uh, exhaust all of your source ports on, on your single snap IP if your connection count is too high. And then the snap pools are smart enough that if you have multiple layer three uh, members in your pool and you have multiple 
um, SNATs that can handle those different uh, you know, destinations, that it'll, it'll use the appropriate uh, L3 address from that pool. So it's, it's uh, pr pretty, pretty cool stuff that, that you can do with, with SNATs. And then, and then, of course, the next level, let's start back over here, uh, is profiles. Uh, if I could spell. So the great thing about profiles is it allows you to customize the experience on each one of your virtual servers. And so if you have TCP characteristics for mobile versus TCP characteristics for desktop, high speed versus ISDN, if you're, if you're anywhere, you might have an ISDN connection or dial up, uh, shudder to think, but you know, dial up is still um, uh, out there in some places. So you know, the, the TCP characteristics of that would be very different. Uh, SSL characteristics from app to app are very different. And so rather than trying to kludge everything together in one massive um, experience on a, 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 a global level for the box or even you know, to span multiple applications, you can break down uh, with various profiles, whether it's TCP or SSL or, uh, or DNS profile, and you can get into the very specifics of what you need for that application. So everything is tuned to make that application go fantastically for the characteristics of the clients that you have. And so all of these basic building blocks, you don't need them all to get an application running, but you have all of this um, accessible to you uh, to the final building block here, which would be a virtual server. And I left out policies. You know, there's certainly you know, policies that you can apply uh, to like for security purposes or for application purposes where you'd use a policy instead of uh, scripting an iRule. We haven't even talked about iRules, but these are the very basic building blocks. So there are other options, um, but these are kind of the, the big ones that you, would, um, that, that you would be concerned about leading up to deploying an application. And so the virtual server. And earlier I mentioned the route. If you don't have a route, the box doesn't know where for the traffic to go. But once you know where the traffic, or once Big IP knows where the traffic can go, the virtual server is acquired so that it will actually allow it to go. Our box, the Big IP, is a default deny box. And so unless you have a virtual server that will accept the traffic destination where it's sending, um, then the, the routes don't really matter. And so the virtual servers can be configured anywhere from handling L4 all the way to handling L7 traffic. So an example would be if you're, if you're load balancing a TCP app. Well, HTTP is a TCP app, but you don't necessarily need to configure it to, to listen for and validate HTTP protocol on that, on that virtual server. You can just keep it at L4 so that it doesn't do as much to it. Maybe you don't really need to inspect it, you just need to load balance it. And so uh, an L4 um, profile would be very good for that. Uh, however, if you do need to validate a protocol at layer seven, and you might need access, and we talked about those policies, and we talked about those I rules. When you want to actually do things to manipulate or inspect uh, or you know, direct traffic at L7, you do need that L7 profile in order to, uh, you know, for it to inspect and, and, and do those things. So uh, other things you can do with virtual servers is you can wildcard them. So if you want to look at all DNS traffic, but you don't really care what the destination is, you can do an all zeros, colon 53. If you care about the IP space, but you don't care about the service, you can wildcard the port. You can wildcard IP and port or partial network and, and port, all kinds of different things that you can do with virtual servers. So I could go on and on and on. In fact, we could probably have 50 light boards for each one of these topics, but uh, I'll, I'll close for now. Thank you for joining me and uh, we'll see you out there in the community.